Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, session. This is a nutrition session. Um, we have eight 15-minute presentations. So um, the speakers will have to forgive the chairs for being brutal with time restrictions. Um, in essence, we've let the speakers know that if they're, if they're hoping to get a question, they should stop around 12 minutes. Uh, if they take the whole 15 minutes, then we'll just have to move on to the next. Um, so um, maybe we can just get started. And so our first presentation is going to be by Andrea Van Holtz. And her presentation, Andrea, where are you? You're there. Is uh, Prospective Associations of Dietary Intake on Insulin Sensitivity and Secretion in Children with Familial Obesity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's a great opportunity to be here to present my work. Uh, do I have a pointer? I have thank, thank, sorry. So I have no conflict of interest in, uh, uh, to declare in link with this presentation. Um, we all know here that type 2 diabetes is not an adult-only disease. In fact, the uh, minimal incidence here in Canada of type 2 diabetes uh, is estimated at 1.5 per 100,000 children aged less than 18 years. And there's an increase in the prevalence of the pre-diabetic state in children, particularly um, among children who are obese. Obesity is the main risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Uh, but little is known on uh, the potential contributions of dietary uh, intake to uh, altered insulin dynamics in children. And in fact, the existing literature, there's a lot of conflicting results in terms of associations between glucose homeostasis and macronutrients, such as total fat, types of fat, saturated or uns polyunsaturated, carbohydrates, fibers, etc. And uh, overall, there's a lack of studies that look at habitual diet or chronic dietary it, uh, exposures. Uh, very few studies have used longitudinal designs. Most studies are cross-sectional. And few studies have considered other lifestyle habits, such as physical activity or sedentary behaviors, which may be important uh, confounders in the association between dietary intake and insulin dynamics. So the objective of, of this study is to determine whether habitual dietary intake predicts insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion over a two-year period in children with a family history of obesity. This study was conducted within the Quebec Adipose and Lifestyle Investigation in, in Youth cohort. The quality cohort includes 630 Caucasian youth. They were aged 8 to 10 years at baseline. They had a family history of obesity, so at least one of their biological parents was obese uh, at, at, at baseline. These kids were recruited through schools uh, located in, in the major metropolitan areas uh, um, of, uh, of uh, the province of Quebec. And two years after the baseline assessment, 564 participants were seen again for a follow-up. So these are the studies that the participants included in the analysis that I'm presenting today. In terms of macronutrients, we measured them using 24-hour dietary recalls on three non-consecutive days. From these data, we extracted the total kilocalorie intake, percent protein, percent fat, saturated fat, carbohydrates, as well as uh, the uh, grams of fiber intake. We also measured the daily servings uh, of uh, the different food groups according to the Canada's Food Guide. Uh, in terms of other uh, uh, measurements, physical activity was assessed using an accelerometer worn over seven days. And from this, we uh, estimated the average uh, minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Sedentary behavior was measured as the, the average daily hours of self-reported screen time. And adiposity was measured uh, using a DEXA scan uh, from which we computed the, the percentage of total body fat mass. Now, in terms of outcomes, we measured insulin sensitivity using an oral glucose tolerance test. So this is the Matsuda Insulin Sensitivity Index. We also used the Fasting Insulin Sensitivity Index, known as the HOMA IR. And for insulin secretion, we also used the uh, oral glucose tolerance test to measure insulin secretion in the first phase, so 30 minutes post-OGPT, and in the second phase, 100 uh, 120 minutes post-OGPT. <coughs> 
In terms of analysis, we use multivariable linear regression analysis, adjusting for age and puberty at follow-up, as well as sex, physical activity, screen time, and percent body fat mass at baseline. And we will, we're also interested in interactions between each of these macronutrients uh, and the baseline percentage of body fat mass. So this uh, table shows some of the uh, descriptors of the participants. Um, at uh, baseline, they were on average 9.6 years old and 11.7 uh, years at follow-up. 55% were boys. If we look at the BMI category, we see that about 60% 60 60 were of normal weight, both at baseline and follow-up. Just under 20% were uh, overweight at baseline and follow-up, and just over 20% were uh, obese uh, at both time points. If we look at moderate to vigorous phys physical activity, it decreased from 51 uh, minutes per day to 42 minutes per day at the, in, uh, after two years, and screen time increased from 2.7 to 3.4 uh, hours per day uh, in the in the, over the two years. Now looking at the insulin sensitivity and insulin, insulin secretion measures, we see that uh, the uh, Matsuda uh, insulin sensitivity dec decreased over the two years, whereas the, both the first phase and second phase insulin secretion increased over the two years. And that largely reflects the fact that uh, at the baseline, only 20% had initiated puberty, and in the follow-up, uh, the vast majority had in initiated puberty. Uh, now, in terms of dietary intake, uh, I'm going to focus on this slide in the, for the food groups because uh, that speaks more to me, at least. Uh, we see that on average, they consume 4.4 servings of fruits and vegetables per day, uh, 4.7 grain products, and uh, just under two servings of meat and alternatives and of milk and alternatives. <coughs> so this figure shows the associations between the dietary intake that are uh, listed at the, on the left column and at, at, so measured at baseline, and the insulin sensitivity measured at follow-up. And so each of these dots co corresponds to a beta coefficient with a 95% confidence interval. So if we look at the, at, uh, at the first uh, macronutrient, percent carbohydrate intake, we see that uh, there, is a, there appears to be a positive association with insulin sensitivity, although it does not reach st statistical significance. But what it means is that for every additional uh, intake, every 1% uh, intake in carbohydrate, insulin sensitivity increases by just over 1%. Now, if we look at fat and saturated fat, we see that for every additional percentage of, of these macronutrient intake, the uh, insulin sensitivity decreases by 1% and 2% each after two years. We see no associations with protein, uh, borderline association with fiber intake, and if we look at fruits and vegetables, we see that every additional portion of fruits and vegetable at baseline is associated with a 2% higher insulin sensitivity two years later. And then for grain products and the meat and dairy products, we see no associations. So this figure shows the main effects, uh, uh, but we were also interested in uh, interactions. So we found interactions for saturated fat and for grain products, and I'm showing these in the next two figures. So here we're looking in the, on the y-axis is the Matsuda insulin sensitivity, and on the x-axis we're looking at the percent of saturated fat intake. And each of these lines rep represent a different level of baseline adiposity, so from the dark blue are the, the leanest to the yellow who are the, the, with the highest adiposity at baseline. And we see that the association between the saturated fat intake and insulin sensitivity is mostly seen about in the kids who have a higher level of adiposity. A similar figure here looking at servings of grain products. And here what we see is that the association is negative in the kids with the highest level of adiposity, so the orange and yellow line, and is actually the other direction in the kids who are the leanest, so the, 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 the two blue lines. And so these, uh, the findings that I'm showing here are for the Matsuda insulin sensitivity index. And when we use the HOMA IR as an outcome, we essentially found the same uh, uh, associations. <coughs> However, when we looked at dietary intake and insulin secretion, we found no association at all. So what are the take-home message uh, messages of the, this study? So first, uh, lowering total and saturated fat intake, as well as increasing servings of fruits and vegetables, may uh, contribute to preventing type 2 diabetes in youth with a family history of obesity. 
by improving their insulin sensi sensitivity, but it has no effect on their insulin secretion. And the second message is that among those children with a high, the higher level of adiposity in pre-puberty, there seems to be a more deleterious effect on insulin sensitivity with greater consumption of saturated fat and of daily servings of grain products. Now, this study is not without limitations. Uh, we know that anyone here who has tried to measure dietary intake, we know that it's difficult to measure with accuracy. And uh, so there is a likelihood of, of measurement error for dietary intake. And the same thing for insulin dynamics. There's no gold standard. So what we're using here are sur validated surrogate measures of insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion. In terms of, of confounding, we adjusted for known potential confounders, uh, but there's no, there could be unmeasured confounders that bias the association. Uh, there's a potential for selection bias because we know that in quality, in a quality cohort, the children that were lost to follow up were more likely, uh, were higher, had a higher adiposity and more insulin resistant at baseline. And in terms of generalizability, uh, the quality is a cohort of Caucasian youth with at least one obese parent. And so we know that we cannot generalize the findings to the entire Canadian population, but at least to a significant proportion of the, the population. And lastly, I would like to thank the collaborators of the study, in particular, Melanie Henderson, who is the PI of the quality cohort, as well as the funders and the families who have made this study possible. Thank Any you. questions? So thank you, uh, Andrea. We have uh, just about four minutes uh, for questions. So um, if there's any one, yes, can you? So can you hear a question on the other side? Or should I repeat? Okay, so uh, the question is why do I think that there's an, a different association between the consumption of, of grain product and adiposity level? And so what we, we looked at the, the total number of servings of grain products, but we did not look at the quality of the grain products that they consume. So maybe there is a difference in the type of grains, uh, grain products that they consume between the obese, the, the children with higher level of adiposity and the children with lower level of adiposity. And so in the then next analysis that we want, would like to look at, at uh, maybe whole grain products and, and whether what the association, association is like with when we look at whole grain products. Thank you. Any other questions? One more. Annalyn Conklin from University of British Columbia. Thank you for your talk. One of the known confounders is maternal education. Did you measure that, and um, why did you not adjust for it? Uh, yes, we did measure it, and we didn't adjust for it. Quality is a generally a higher SES group uh, because it required participants to be uh, to to for a full day uh, of of tests. Uh, for the study, and both parents had to be available at baseline uh, to participate in the study. So overall, we have a higher SES study. However, there is some vari variation in the in socioeconomic status, and that is something that we uh, could look at. So thank you for uh, suggesting it. In good time. So next, I'd like to introduce Mark Baumhoff, who's going to present histological improvements of non-alcoholic hepatitis with a prebiotic, a pilot clinical trial. Okay, so as mentioned, this is a, a pilot clinical uh, control uh, pilot clinical trial, and um, this is some of the work that I did for my uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation with Raylene Reimer at the University of Calgary. So I don't have any commercial interest. The supplement that we were using was provided by Benio, Arafti Incorporated, so they provided us with the pre-packaged oligofructose prebiotic supplements. So I suppose if you purchase this, uh, they could benefit from the sale of this product. 
So this data has been examined by an external committee, so that mitigates the bias somewhat. And if you don't want to purchase this product, and, and I'm not going to make a specific recommendation, you can just eat a lot of chicory root. And this is where Benio would derive the inulin and the oligofructose. So the liver is a very important organ, and one of its functions is not to store fat, but in certain, well, in obesity and metabolic syndrome, you have this uh, susceptibility to increase fat storage within the liver. And this is due to ins the flux of free fatty acids from insulin-resistant adipose tissue could be, in some individuals, increased novo lipogenesis. So this affects about 30% of the population, and in obesity, it's about 75%. Normally, just having steatosis isn't problematic, but in some individuals, about 10 to 25%, this, this steatosis can advance to a more serious form called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is where the immune system gets involved. In this immune system, well, you can get hepatic cell injury, which can then lead to cirrhosis, fibrosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, increased risk, and ultimately end-stage liver failure. So it's one of the leading indications for a liver transplantation. And if you have NAPLED, the, your physician there's not a lot of effective treatments. Your physician will tell you lifestyle management. So eat better and exercise more. And we all know that that's not a very effective treatment. So to diagnose non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you use a, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, you use a liver biopsy. And this is scored on steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning. So the inflammation gets a score at a three. The Inflammation or the inflammation score at a three, and then ballooning a score at a two for a total score of eight. If you have a score of five or greater, that's considered NASH. So the pathophysiology of NASH and steatosis, it was largely believed that so you it's a two-hit hypothesis. You get this increase in steatosis, followed by you get oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation. The hypothesis has expanded somewhat, so now they call it the multiple parallel hit hypothesis, and one of the triggers there is from adipose tissue. So you have these inflammatory cytokines that are um, coming from dysregulated adipose tissue, and that can activate these Kupfer cells, these resident macrophages within the liver, and that triggers a cascade that then get, activates these stellate cells, which then deposit collagen within the space of Dissay, and you kind of get this chicken wire fibrosis within the liver. And you also have altered hormone uh, expression from some of this adipose tissue. Another factor that's more recently introduced to this uh, disease is dysbiotic gut microbiota. So dysbiotic gut microbiota can induce an inflammation within the gut that's thought to impair the intestinal permeability, allowing some of these, allowing endotoxins, some of these bacterial components through the gut where it can activate these same cascades. And the, the proximity through the portal vein uh, between the gut and the liver makes these, these uh, triggers even that much more potent. Also, you have the effect of the gut microbiota on the adipose tissue, and that way the gut microbiota is kind of an indirect link to the cause of this disease or to the association with this disease. So several studies have looked at the profile of gut microbiota in NASH, and several studies have found that there are differences between someone uh, who does not have this disease. So if you look here, you can see an increase in lactobacillus, an increase in escherichia, increase in clostridium coccoides, decrease in bacterioides. Another study has shown an increase in bacterioides, a decrease in Prevotella. We also see uh, the study by Zhu et al., an increase in proteobacteria, entero Enterobacteriaceae and, and Escherichia and a decrease in Bifidobacteria. Now, some of those uh, bacteria that are increased, they're known to produce ethanol, so potentially that's a mechanism there as well. Other studies have also identified that there's a bacterial overgrowth in the, in the small intestine. But overall, you can kind of see that there's not a really consistent profile that's associated with this disease. So, if there's a dysbiosis, potentially improving that dysbiosis can have a positive impact on this disease. So you can influence the gut microbiota with a prebiotic. Now, a prebiotic is a non-digestible compound or carbohydrate 
that's metabolized by the gut microbiota and it influences the composition and activity in such a way that it benefits the, the physiological health of the host. So prebiotics have been shown to improve this dysbiosis and also increase the production of short-chain fatty acids. So that these changes can improve gut barrier function by inducing gut trophic signals and increasing the, or uh, maintaining the uh, tight junction proteins. So that's going to decrease the LPS that's translocated, lipopolysaccharide, which is the gram-negative component of bacteria, or a, it's a cell component. So that causes a decrease in the uh, in, uh, activation of the innate immune system. We also have improvements in adipose tissue. So a decrease, you get decreased energy harvest potentially, and that decrease in LPS. There's also a reduction in the genes that are responsible for hepatic uh, lipogenesis. And insulin sensitivity is also improved, so you get an increase in GLP-1, which is an incretin hormone stimulating the production of insulin in the pancreas. Decrease in visceral adipose tissue, and you also have improved satiety and a decrease in hunger. This is due to the GLP-1 increase in PYY from the hindgut, and you also have a little bit of reduction in ghrelin. So most of this animal, or work I should mention, has been conducted in animal studies, some in human studies. So our objective was to determine if a prebiotic supplement would be beneficial for improving histological parameters of non-alcoholic fatty, or NASH. Other studies have looked at prebiotics, but they've never looked at uh, histological markers, and the, the liver biopsy is the gold standard for measuring this disease. So we recruited individuals who had liver biopsy confirmed NASH, score of five or greater. We randomized them into oligofructose or the placebo, and the oligofructose was provided in little packets, so eight gram packets. In the first week, so we had week zero, 12, 24, and 36 where we followed up. So at first 12 weeks, they only got eight grams of this prebiotic because there can be a little bit of a side effect, so we wanted to slowly initiate this. And then afterwards, they consumed 16 grams for the following, uh, from week 12 to week 36. So they came in, we had, did a body weight, DEXA scan. We also collected a poop sample for gut microbiota analysis. And at these specific times, they would go to a different la uh, lab within the city of Calgary and provide blood. They had an oral glucose tolerance test. And we used that blood then to measure cytokines, to measure lipids, uh, liver function tests, and uh, other hormones. And then at the end, we had another follow-up liver biopsy. So we assessed 46 patients, and we, 27 weren't eligible for the study, didn't meet cri uh, inclusion criteria, and uh, a few uh, declined to participate in the study. So altogether, we recruited 14. We had eight in the prebiotic group and six in the placebo group. You can see that, uh, so three females, five males in the prebiotic, three female, uh, equal ratio in the placebo, and the B average BMI was around 34. Unfortunately, one of the liver biopsies in the placebo group, uh, there wasn't enough sample there to uh, do histology on the sample, so we lost that one. In terms of results, the body weight, the average body weight was not affected whatsoever through over the course of this study. You can see that, that between the prebiotic and the placebo is more or less the same. There was, at baseline, there was a slightly higher body fat composition in the placebo group, but these, uh, the, the body composition stayed the same over the course of the study. We only performed the DEXA scans at week 0, 12, and 36. When we look at the liver biopsy results, so uh, it's composite score of steatosis, inflammation, ballooning, and uh, the NAS score. So steatosis out of three, here we had a significant reduction in the prebiotic group in steatosis. So it went down by, uh, close to, to one, or about 0 0.75. Inflammation, there was somewhat of a trend towards reduced inflammation with the prebiotic. Ballooning, there was no change. And overall, when you add up the score, you see a significant reduction in the NAS score in the prebiotic group. And this was significant between the two groups. So we did 16S, gene, or, uh, 16S rRNA gene sequencing, and we were looking at the, the back, or gut microbiota composition. 
And you can see on the x-axis there, you've got week 0, 12, 24, and 36, and then relative abundance. The two primary phyla bacteria are Formicides and Bacterioides. But the one we were interested in is Actinobacteria. And you can see in the yellow box there, so at baseline, the yellow box is the same between prebiotic and, pro and placebo. In, at week 12, you see a significant increase in that yellow box showing an increase in actinobacteria. At week 24, uh, we see even greater increase, and that more or less stayed the same at week 36. Dropping down a level to family, you can see that bacteria, bac bifidobacteria yeastiae also increased. So in that orange box there, uh, you can see an increase at week 12, 24, and then at week 36. Somewhat disappointing with the blood work that we had collected. So we were look, I'm just presenting uh, changes here. And this was actually from repeated measures at the four different time points. But we're looking at glycemia. We saw no changes. This is percent change pre-post. No changes in adiponectin or other hormones. And so that uh, glycemia was AUC from the oral glucose tolerance test that we'd done four times. No changes in the liver function tests, no changes in the lipids, LDL, no change in the inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha. LPS, we did see a trend towards a reduction with the prebiotic, but we didn't see any, uh, this was not significant. And there seemed to be a bit of an increase in the placebo. Prebiotics, because they're a carbohydrate that's fermented within an anaerobic environment, they can produce gas, and one of the unfortunate side effects is flatulence. So we wanted to measure uh, the tolerability to these, to these supplements. No one's going to take a supplement if they're extremely uncomfortable uh, on a daily basis with this. So we use a visual analog scale, and we found that there were no differences with the 16 grams uh, uh, prebiotic compared to the control. So in terms of acceptability, convenience, and tolerability. Interestingly, so a few participants in both groups actually noted that increased flatulence was one of the side effects. So it was maltodextrin which was used as a placebo. It shouldn't be fermented. So it was kind of an interesting finding to see that uh, people were complaining of increased flatulence. But it has been reported in the literature as well. Despite the increase in flatulence, uh, participants did note that they would continue to take the product if it was proven to be beneficial for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So limitations with this study. One of the problems, participants were identified to have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis by their physicians. They were notified, they were informed of the lifestyle management, and a lot of people went on a bit of a crash diet. So they lost uh, you know, a good chunk of weight. By the time I had them recruited into the study to do baseline work, they'd already lost 10 pounds or 10 kilograms. So that would have affected some of the baseline results and potentially masked some of the trends that we saw in, uh, in the data. Also, a liver biopsy, you're only really sampling 150 th thousandth of the liver. So it's a very small sample. And the steatosis and the inflammation within the liver is not homogenous, so potentially you could have skewed results in that regard as well. Also, liver biopsies are quite painful, and participants were not eager to have a repeat liver biopsy. And there's a lot of new technologies out there, so it made recruitment very, very difficult for this particular study. And blood sampling, it wasn't ideal, but to increase the convenience, we, had, we allowed people to donate blood throughout the city. And so they, we had a different technician handling every single sample. They were spun them down, put them in their freezer, and I'd pick them up. So potentially the handling could have affected a lot of these uh, different blood parameters as well. And ideally, we would have liked to include a GLP-1 uh, within our analysis, but because you need specific inhibitors, we couldn't uh, actually uh, provide those inhibitors to get that, that sample. So overall, the take-home message, so independent of other lifestyle uh, factors, the prebiotic did improve histological parameters of, of steatosis within this population. So it's a small sample size, and a larger clinical trial would be required to uh, provide more conclusive evidence. So I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Raylene Reimer. Jill Parnell, Parnell also helped out with the design of the study. Doctors Ramon, Jaya Kumar, and Ryu helped with patient recruitment. And Dr. Henna Remy also helped with the gut microbiota analysis. Any questions? Sorry. 
So we won't have time for questions. Uh, Mark, uh, hopefully, will be around at the end. So if anybody wants to ask him questions, they can find him. So I'd like to ask Jessica McNeil to come up. Jessica is going to present on the, the effects of partial sleep restriction on olfactory performance and 24-hour energy intake in men and women. So thank you very much for your introduction. I thought I'd start my talk today by addressing the issue of generalizability. So please, by show of hands, how many of you sleep regularly? <laughs> I've studied sleep long enough to know its purpose. And by show of hands, how many of you have maybe feel a little sleep deprived due to attending this conference? So in terms of generalizability, I would say the sleep restriction affects us all at some point. And this conference could be a great example of that. So more specifically, uh, this talk will be looking at the effects of partial sleep restriction on olfactory performance or smell sensitivity, and how these potential changes may be related to changes in energy intake following uh, sleep restriction. Oh, and the wrong button. The green one. The green one, perfect. All right, so before I start, I have no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. And so a large number of experimental studies that have looked at the effects of an imposed uh, partial sleep restriction on 24-hour energy intake have noted uh, statistically significant increases within the range of three to 500 calories over a 24-hour period, which if sustained over the long term uh, can uh, most likely contribute to weight gain over time. And it's hypothesized that this uh, is probably a strong contributor to uh, explaining the link between obesity and uh, short sleep uh, short sleep duration or sleep restriction. So why the entrance in uh, smell sensitivity or olfactory performance? Well, when you think of, um, you know, historically or in terms of food seeking behavior, uh, your sense of smell as well as any or every other sense is used uh, in order to encourage you to seek food and uh, find food as well as consume food for survival. And so greater olfactory performance does has a, have a functional role in driving food intake behavior. One particular study has looked at uh, changes in olfactory performance uh, following 24-hour uh, total sleep deprivation and actually reported decline in olfactory performance, which suggests that this uh, particular sense may be impeded uh, following uh, sleep deprivation. And so why did we uh, look at this particular variable within the context of this study? Well, no say to date has actually looked at the impact of partial sleep restriction, which is what you more commonly see in everyday life, comparatively to 24 hour uh, complete wake uh, total deprivation. And so we looked, we wanted to see whether 50% uh, sleep restriction condition comparatively to habitual sleep impacts uh, smell sensitivity and whether the changes in smell sensitivity may be related to changes in energy intake that are frequently reported following sleep restriction. And so we had 12 men and six women that completed all sessions. They had to adhere to a number of inclusion criteria, mostly related to uh, stable body weight. They could not be taking any medication that would impact appetite, food intake, or sleep. And they had to have pretty uh, regular sleep patterns. And so they all reported sleeping between seven to nine hours per night and uh, going to bed and waking up at uh, regular uh, time points. Uh, they all took part in three experimental sessions, which followed a randomized crossover uh, design. And so one of the sessions was a control condition, natural and habitual sleep duration condition. For this condition, uh, the sleep, uh, sorry, the bed and wake times were individualized for each participant. And so we track uh, their sleep patterns with accelerometry and sleep batteries for two consecutive weeks. And we used their mean uh, bed and wake times uh, for, from those sessions, from that data, pardon me, in order to determine their sleep uh, time during the control. So for instance, if we have someone who on average over a two week period went to bed at 10 p.m. and woke up at 6 a.m., that would be their control session. So they're si assigned bed and wake time during that session. And they also took part in two 50% sleep restriction conditions, which deferred in their sleep timing. And so one of them, we advanced their wake time, and so they were allowed to sleep for the first half of the night, and the second one, we delayed their bedtime. And so they were allowed to sleep for the second half uh, of that regular sleep period. For this particular analysis, because it was a secondary analysis, uh, we decided to only compare the control 
and the 50% sleep restriction with advanced wake time condition due to our small sample size, but also because uh, REM sleep duration, which is a sleep stage, is greatly, uh, relate, can greatly impact prefrontal cortex function, especially um, olfaction. And so when you advance wake time, you selectively reduce REM sleep duration because REM sleep duration is more prominent during the early morning hours. So if you compare a sleep restriction with delayed bedtime, REM sleep duration is often very comparable to what you would see in a control condition. And so that's why we decide to select uh, this sleep restriction with advanced wake time condition as our sleep restriction condition. Uh, Sleep architecture was measured inside the lab with polysomnography, and uh, faction was measured with a validated uh, kit called the Sniffin' Sticks kit. And so this provides you information on uh, order threshold, discrimination, and identification. All three scores can be combined uh, to give you an aggregate total order scores. And so in total, you get four different variables uh, that uh, give you an indication of olfactory performance. And energy intake was measured inside the lab as well with a uh, validated food menu. And so this is a list of 62 different food and beverage items from which the participants were able to choose what they may want to consume. And the foods are then presented to them in ad libitum quantities and they're simply instructed to eat as much or as little as you want. Uh, what is the foods are measured pre and post uh, consumption and that's how we're able to determine energy intake. So it's a difference in uh, the weight of the food that they consumed. Uh, we, for the rest of the day, they were allowed to leave the lab, but not without a, a lunchbox filled of food that they selected. And so we asked them to select the foods that they may want to consume for the rest of that day. Again, we give it to them in that live them quantities. They go home with uh, a lunchbox container and they bring it back the next day. And again, we uh, weigh all the foods pre-post. For statistical analysis, we conducted a one-way uh, repeat measures ANOVA to assess the effects of the sleep condition, so the control versus sleep restriction, and sex as a between participant factor on olfactory performance. Uh, we then um, built a linear regression model in order to assess the strength of the associations between changes in olfactory performance, which was the delta score between the sessions, with changes in delta 24 hour energy intake. Uh, we added sex, age, and delta sleep duration to our model as covariates because of their strong. Uh, association with either the exposure and or the outcome. And so this graph presents uh, the differences in the amount of time spent during in the, each of the sleep stages uh, between the conditions. As expected, there was a significant difference in the amount of time spent in each of the sleep stages uh, between the habitual sleep and sleep restriction condition. And this table simply presents um, the condition and sex effects, and finally the sex by condition interactions for each of our outcomes. And so the four variables relate to order performance and finally 24 hour energy intake. And so if we look at condition effect first, there were uh, no significant uh, condition effects for any of our outcomes. When looking at sex effect, there was only a significant uh, difference between men and women for 24 hour energy intake, which you would expect to see in these trials. So men generally eat more than women. Uh, very interesting is uh, that we noted a significant sex by condition interaction for the order discrimination and TDI scores. And this translated into a significant increase in order scores in men following sleep restriction compared to control, whereas women saw a decrease in their order scores following sleep restriction compared to, to control. And finally, we do not see any statistically significant associations between delta olfactory performance with uh, changes in 24 hour energy intake. And so in conclusion, uh, we did note a uh, significant uh, sex effect uh, with our condition. So women had a decrease, whereas men saw an increase olfactory performance following sleep restriction comparatively to habitual sleep duration. Um, as we are the first study to uh, run uh, this kind of analysis we had not much to compare it to, but there's one other study that looked at differences uh, between sexes in energy intake following imposed sleep restriction, and they noted uh, that men had a greater increase in their energy intake following sleep restriction comparatively to women, 
uh, when compared to a control condition. And so it suggests that men may be more negatively impacted in terms of energy intake uh, following uh, sleep restriction. However, there were our uh, associations or results from the linear regression models do not support this type of hypotheses. And so we did not see any differences in 24 hour energy intake between conditions between men and women, nor were changes in olfactory performance associated with energy intake. So finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the CIHR as well as Alberta Innovates Health Solutions for funding my current postdoctoral fellowship, as well as my colleagues at the University of Ottawa and the University of Quebec and Outaouais for their long hours of work uh, on this study. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jessica. We actually have about four minutes for questions, so are there any questions from the audience? We can bring you the microphone. Thank you. Did you um, measure the olfactory uh, test at the same time each day? And depending on when they woke up, like if they were had an advanced wake up time, what were they doing in the time period before they came in for testing? Okay, so the lab, uh, the participants were in the lab the entire time. And so, um, for instance, for delayed back time condition, they still arrived at the same time as every other condition. And so they remained in the lab, same, time we, same thing when we woke them up early. They remained in the lab and they were allowed to do any sedentary activity. So they were not allowed to exercise or do anything that may impact appetite, but they were allowed to read, watch movies, do things like that, keep them occupied. And olfaction was measured at the exact same time of day during each condition. So that said, when they woke up much earlier, their elapsed wake time between doing the test and being awoken is greater than the other two conditions. Um, but then it becomes, you know, a trade-off. Do you have everyone do the test much earlier and then eat much earlier on that one condition compared to the other two? Then it's not very comparable. So we decided to just standardize clock time. So our measurements were done at the exact same clock time. Thank you for your talk. I'm curious whether there were any sex differences in the chronotype between these participants. That's a very good question. Um, we did assess chronotype with a questionnaire. And that's a really, really good question. Something to think I, about. Yeah, I will look at that, because we do have that data. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you. Awesome. So now I'd like to invite Martin Binks up to the podium. He's going to present a study, Limited Potential of the Food Craving Inventory and Three-Factor Eating Questionnaire to Predict Brain Food Cue Reactivity in Subjects with Obesity. Okay, these are my disclosures, and uh, both financial and non-financial. In terms of this presentation, uh, there was no direct funding for this program. However, the study I'm speaking of was funded by Nestle uh, Health Sciences, and uh, the funding agency wasn't involved in the development of the, the protocol or the analysis or decisions to present the data. Uh, so, uh, the, the overarching look here is to see whether or not the food craving inventory and the three-factor eating questionnaire, which are uh, measures that are frequently used in the examination of, of uh, elements of behavioral elements that influence ingestion, whether those are actually reflected in brain regions that would make sense based on how these measures are described and defined. So, um, at the outset, hedonic control and homeostatic control are two factors that regulate the decisions to ingest. The homeostatic mechanisms include uh, sensory afferents and signals, both endocrine and neural, from the gut, and uh, also the, um, the adipose tissue, liver, pancreas, and, and even muscle tissue provide signaling through that system that also signal brain regions that influence the, um, uh, the decision to ingest based on the available nutrients and or uh, energy in, this, in the system. Uh, the other side of that picture is hedonic control. Uh, that includes emotions, 
Uh, on the right there, learn preferences and uh, sensory inputs, vision, hearing, smell, taste, etc. And, and these are all also influenced by the executive regions in the brain that exert control over that decision process. All of these, and I'd love to have a pointer, but um, all, all of these um, are combined, uh, the, both the hedonic and homeostatic processes to uh, determine the ultimate execution of ingestive behavior. So in terms of the regions of interest in the brain, we have the um, emotional and executive regions and the uh, learned preferences all contributing to hedonic control as I suggested. We, uh, particularly the DLPFC is involved in the executive control, the decision making. We don't use the word inhibitory because, it's, uh, but that, that's the best way to describe it. Uh, so it, it actually acts on the reward regions that are listed on the right and has a, a dampening effect on that activation with, uh, without, largely out of awareness. But the, the idea is that when the reward regions are very activated by food cues that the DLPFC will uh, help us to not act on those decisions. The, um, the information about executive, uh, sorry, the information about hedonic and homeostatic uh, need to eat is also is uh, combined in the nucleus accumbens and some other regions that leads to an ultimate decision whether to ingest or not to ingest, uh, which is uh, executed by the primary motor cortex. FMRI, as many of you know, many of you know MRI, and actually I'm surprised sometimes people don't know FMRI. It's basically an MRI machine where we put people in it that we're able to get them to do stuff. I'm fa I like the olfactory stuff. We don't do that yet. But um, w visual images can be presented to a subject while they're lying in the scanner. And then at the end result of that, after a great deal of uh, manipulation of electrons and data, are those pretty pictures that you see uh, of the brain lighting up in response. It's got very good temporal and spatial um, resolution, much better than the old PET scans. And uh, we basically use the, what it uses is the alterations in blood oxygenation to identify what areas are or are not active. Um, so in the context of what we're trying to talk about today, food cravings, frequent irresistible desires to consume specific types of food. The relationship with BMI has been somewhat um, weak uh, overall, but, but it's there. The extended calorie restriction, however, is shown to um, be associated with reductions in food cravings. The food craving inventory is the most widely used. We just did a, recently did a meta-analysis and, and largely it's the food craving inventory with some others that are used and they uh, follow some similar dimensions, uh, rating different individual types of foods on their, on a Likert scale. And the food craving inventory, it's important to note that it's suppo typically supposed to be administered according to the last three months. So we consider that to be a measure of a trait that should be somewhat stable over time. Um, okay. So um, the dietary restraint is another broader concept that will be reflected in, in part of the next scale that I'm going to talk about, and it's the intent to restrict food to control weight. And we all know that in the eating disorder literature with restrained eaters and so forth, um, and extended calorie restriction is associated with dietary restraint. Uh, the three-factor eating questionnaire has three scales, one of which is particularly designed to measure dietary restraint. Uh, the other is disinhibition, which is a loss of the ability to restrain, is the one way to describe it, and susceptibility to hunger. Uh, we've already mentioned what dietary restraint is. All these scales have reasonable uh, validity and reliability. Um, disinhibition is uh, defined as a susceptibility to overeat when, overeat when the circumstances favor eating, so abundant palatable food is a good example and stress could be another. And then susceptibility to hunger is kind of a, I won't say, I love Mickey Stunkert, it's kind of a weirdly defined, he, they created the scale, but this is a weirdly defined one, especially when you're talking about trying to identify what it's trying to do. It's the perception of changes in satiety, so it's not actually a measure of a visual analog type scale of satiety, it's your perception of it. 
Um, it's not, it doesn't show up in the literature as much. The gaps in the literature that we wanted to address with this uh, study were you know, what I've said about the, the food, food craving inventory and three-factor eating questionnaire based in the way their scales are described and what their purposes are. Often in the literature you'll read, and I called a number of people to make sure I wasn't just reading it based on my, I like soap boxes, and my soap box was, do these really show up in the brain regions that everybody often implies they should? So the craving equals hedonic activation, it equals the reward pathways lighting up. Um, and similarly with, with the three-factor eating questionnaire, and we didn't find anything actually suggesting that that was the case. So we wanted to examine these two measures in the context of fMRI food pew reactivity uh, in people with obesity. These are just graphic representations of our, our thinking and hypotheses going in. So um, as you'll see on the bottom, we have increasing scores in the food craving inventory. So given what we know about these brain regions, we would expect with higher scores on, on the food craving inventory, we would see um, lower activations in, in food career activity in the executive control regions, the DLPFC. Uh, similarly, if you see increasing food, pew, uh, food craving inventory scores, one would expect to see the pleasure and reward pathways uh, having a much, more, a much higher reactivity to food cues presented in the scanning. Um, the other side was looking at the uh, three-factor eating questionnaire. So the disinhibition and susceptibility to hunger scales, as those scores increased, we would have expected to see uh, increases in the pleasure and reward activation areas. And in, the, um, in terms of the restraint scale, the DLPFC, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, executive inhibition, so to speak, and, and obviously we, you would think there would be more food curie activity in that area as the scores on the restraint scale uh, increase. This was part of a larger study. This was a randomized controlled clinical trial actually to compare the uh, differences in food curie activity in two different diet types, one of which was a uh, total meal replacement and the other was a food-based uh, isocaloric diet over a short term, but in the fMRI world, it's a long term, a three week uh, uh, exposure. Uh, that data has been presented elsewhere. Uh, we had 32 male and 30 and uh, female subjects combined, as you can see. Our main criteria were eliminating people that couldn't be in the scanner and uh, specific diseases, conditions that affect food cure activity. Uh, one of the unique aspects of this study, a lot of the fMRI food cure activity stuff does not control the menstrual cycle and it has quite profound effects on food curie activity. So we scheduled everybody in the same phase of the menstru menstrual cycle to control for that. And uh, the, the model here is they came in uh, for this particular aspect of the study. They came in, they were given food craving inventory, three-factor eating questionnaire, and then they were scanned and given the food curie activity paradigm. We're proud of our image bank. It's uh, 240 total images, half food, half object. They're matched on, on uh, visual quality and hedonic uh, ratings, so we did an independent study. So we have things like Lamborghinis up against Chocolate Sunday. That's a bad one because they don't look alike. This picture shows you roses and those strawberries may actually have a similar hedonic value in our, our pilot. They look the same, so the brain's not reacting to the pretty size, shape, and so forth. And uh, that model has worked very well. They rate while they're in the scanner the how much they uh, how much the image appeals to them. So we have appeal ratings. This is just for the people interested in how we analyze the data. I, I, won't, I won't waste a lot of time on that. Uh, if you're interested, uh, talk to me afterwards. But um, basically, we used uh, some mixed models to compare the do the correlations in terms of uh, food cure activity and um, the scores on the various scales. Um, baseline characteristics are uh, worth talking about. So getting to the meat, we had, um, we had over, we had only three significant correlations in the 14 regions of interest in the brain that were chosen based on their likelihood to be important in this based on other studies. Um, by eight subscales in the correlation matrix. And only three things were significant. 
the uh, anti anterior cingulate cortex is, is, uh, was predicted overall food craving and uh, one specific food craving for high fat food. It does play a role in garnering uh, resources for the DLPFC in an in inhib inhibitory role. It may be because of that that we saw that finding. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but overall, there were no, none of the other regions were significantly correlated with any of the scales of these measures. This is just a quick validity check. We know brain regions that should be associated and, and more active according to BMI, and uh, they all were. So that, that tells us that our data was, was solid and intact. So the, the, the summary here is that, as I already said, the negative correlation with the ACC may reflect that role in the inhibitory process, but the ACC is also involved in other things. Uh, but in this case, based on some other data, we, we're, we think that it is reflecting a little bit of the inhib inhibition. Uh, but overall, the subscales of these, these behavioral measures don't appear to be reflected in those brain regions that one would expect based on how they're described and what they purport to be measuring. Um, the, um, it's not to say that these measures aren't any use. They are very useful, they do things behaviorally that are useful, and, and they, they predict some things behaviorally. So the, the take home message is that we need to be careful in using these measures in the behavioral literature as surrogates for brain function, or, or implying that they are. It's a little bit like the causality versus association debates. In my world, this is one of those debates also, right? So be careful when we imply the brain's doing something that it is not. Uh, so real quickly, our, um, couple of limitations, uh, our subjects did vary in scanning, uh, pre-scan fasting beyond the eight, uh, eight hours that we suggested, but it was largely focused around six to 10, I think, um, with a couple outliers. Um, the COPES may be conservative. That basically is telling you that there's, if you look at the prior levels of our analysis, you'll see bigger areas of the brain that might be included in, say, the nucleus accumbens. But in order to be more conservative, we use these probability things that have been created by um, combining many, many people because brains are different sizes and shapes and we take uh, the 95% likelihood that it'll show that that brain region is in that area. So it's a good way to not overinterpret your findings. Several strengths, the, the controlling for menopausal status, um, as I just mentioned, using the probability masks and um, there's a, a strong debate about uh, inflating type 1 error in the neuroscience literature, and we use methods that actually aren't a part of that, uh, that debate that help us uh, know that we're seeing what we're seeing because it exists is a short form of that. So I want to uh, acknowledge health, Nestle Health Science for their help in, in us doing all this work and the obesity, Canadian Obesity Network for having me here. And I, I really want to thank um, Tyler Davis, who is a, a neuroscientist we work with, and particularly Chanika Kahapadua, who could, and I'm not him, who was listed in your app. Uh, he would have loved to have been here to present this data. He plays a huge role in, in the physiology and analysis of the data. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin. Unfortunately, we won't have time for questions for Martin, um, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, seek him out at the end. Well, thank you for staying, and uh, don't leave now because we've got four excellent presentations still coming up. Uh, um, it's a pleasure for me to co-chair this with Michael. I see you got the email about the hair. Um, and, uh, and maybe we've been sitting for an hour. Maybe we could all just sort of stand up for about 30 seconds and stretch or do something like that. <laughs> now you're not allowed to leave, though, when you stay <laughs> up, right? it's just. So our next speaker is uh, Jacinthe Laferine, and she will be speaking about the validation of the Canadian Healthy Eating Index from, or from 2007.
So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks as well to the scientific committee for this opportunity to present recent results of my research today. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I will mention that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. As you know, in Canada, nutritional guidelines are promoted through the Canada's Food Guide. Uh, these guidelines uh, ensure that adequate nutrient intake is achieved and uh, as well to prevent uh, chronic diseases. However, when it comes to adherence to those guidelines, the statistics are a bit disappointing. Um, in fact, only 26% of the Canadian population met the uh, recommended uh, amount of vegetable and fruit uh, for their age group. Uh, this led my research team to develop a wide project on adherence to nutritional guidelines, in which the first step is to optimize uh, nutritional assessment as well as uh, adherence measurements. Uh, first developed in 1999 by, in, by the USDA, the LT Eating Index is a score that particularly addresses this issue. Out of a score of 100, uh, 50 50 points are uh, attributed for adequacy of intake with the different food group. Uh, and addi additionally, 30 other points are uh, given for moderation in intake of nutrient associated with health. So in those cases, higher intake will be associated with a reduced score and the opposite as well. And lastly, a 10 point is added if nutrient from each food group is uh, presented. A Canadian version of this score has been proposed and validated by Lise Dubois in 2000. As you can see, it's basically the exact same thing, besides the fact that the vegetable and fruit component are uh, put together in the same group, and uh, the adequacy uh, component are assessed by uh, using the, the portion recommended in, through the uh, 2000, well, 1992 uh, Canada's Food Guide. Then a number of Canadian studies using this car were published over the past years. Uh, however, uh, as you know, the guidelines uh, has been updated in Canada in 2007. So we thought it would be more uh, appropriate to assess adherence using the latest age and sex recommendations. Uh, however, this specific modification to the SCAR uh, have not been uh, validated in depth yet. Another issue raised from the study published to date is that the LT eating score is equally obtained from data uh, of food frequency questionnaire and 24-hour recall. However, from our research on food assessment, we often observe that those two techniques are not matched, not matched strongly. Uh, while the food frequency questionnaires have been used for a long time because they are more easy to use and they directly address usual intake, it now appears that taking uh, multiple days of 24-hour recall, uh, that which can be easily done using web-based software, uh, will bring higher accuracy level. However, when it comes to assessment of diet quality, there is no study today that compare directly those two techniques. Therefore, the aim of this project was twofold. First, to use um, uh, established processes to assess the validity of the LT eating index based on the 2007 Canada's Food Guide, and uh, to use this analysis as a starting point to uh, determine if either food uh, LT eating index uh, assessed with one to four days of 24-hour recall or a food frequency questionnaire will produce equivalent and reliable scores. To do so, we asked 75 women and 73 men uh, to fill a one food frequency questionnaire and four non-consecutive days of 24-hour recall, uh, all on a web-based platform. To assess validity, we uh, based our <laughs> analysis on uh, published studies about quality score, and we selected six validation criteria. To determine the internal validity, we observe a dispersion of the result, association with uh, selected nutrients, internal consistency, and the independence with energy intake. To assess external validity, we uh, assess uh, the, um, well, we first tested the repeatedly reported difference between men and women in diet quality. And then we uh, analyzed sample menu derived it from the Canada's food guide provided on El Canada's website to see if they obtain a perfect score, which would be uh, supposed to be. 
And then we did comparison analysis, basically uh, correlation and kappa score, to determine if those different techniques will classify uh, the participants similarly. So here's the subject characteristics. So basically the mean age was 47 years old, the mean BMI was 25, so it's pretty in the average. Here you see the mean and dispersion of the score with the different tools. Uh, first, for one to four days of 24-hour recall, the uh, average were not different, not significantly different, and they spread quite similarly. Uh, but the result obtained from the food frequency questionnaire was significantly higher than the other method. Uh, concerning the association with nutrients, here you can see that uh, uh, data obtained from three and four days of 24-hour recall uh, presents significant correlation with five out of the seven nutrient analyzed, while the result obtained from the food frequency questionnaire correlate with only two of the nutrient analyzed. However, when we uh, analyze specifically the fruit and vegetable component, uh, the, there is significant correlation for all the nutrient with most of the technique analyzed. Here you can see the uh, association between each component and the sum of all the other components. So it's mostly the total score. Um, and the idea behind it is to assess internal consistency. So to see if all the complement kind of lead in the same direction. What we can see is that the fruit and vegetable complement, as well as the moderation complement, were the one that were most strongly associated with the total score with each technique. And we also can see that the food frequency questionnaire seems to demonstrate a weaker internal consistency than the other techniques. Here is the result for the analyze uh, between the LT ending score and the energy intake. Ideally, we will, will, will be expected that the um, uh, diet quality score will be independent of energy intake. At the first sight, we can see a negative association between the score and the amount of energy. However, if we looked at the result for men and women separately, we can see that this association totally disappeared. This means that it was only um, uh, shown because women uh, had a higher a diet quality result while consuming lower amount of calorie. And indeed, the group, uh, no, the group analysis demonstrate that women did have a significantly higher diet quality score, uh, which corroborate what is usually seen in diet quality analysis. And as we expected, the, the sample menu provided on Health Canada's website uh, obtained almost perfect scores. And uh, lastly, here you can see the uh, the uh, agreement analysis between four days of 24-hour recalls and the four other techniques. Uh, as you can see, for the total score and all the complement, there is a significant and positive correlation. However, uh, we can see that the uh, coefficient is affected by the numbers of 24-hour recalls, and it's poor for the food frequency questionnaire. And the last column shows the kappa score, which indicates the agreement between quartile classification and usually, we will, we will say that a, a kappa score below 0.4 is associated with a weak uh, agreement. So uh, in our case, the result shows that using only one day of 24-hour recall or a food frequency questionnaire could lead to a significantly different classification of the cohort when compared to four days of 24-hour recall. So to conclude, uh, we observed that with all technique tested, the LT eating score met most of the validation criteria. However, the results were improved when we use multiple days of 24-hour recalls. Uh, and the take-home message will be that the assessment of diet quality based on one single 24-hour recall or a food frequency questionnaire should be interpreted with caution and cannot be directly compared to multiple days of 24-hour recalls. So I would like to thank my supervisor and all the team <laughs> for their help in this project. And I'll be happy to answer a question if there's some time. Yes, we have lots of time for questions. Yeah, so. I speak fast. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but understood. Yeah. Question? No? Ah, yes, thank you. Sorry, I didn't see you at first. Here. Here you go. I'm a judge, so I should just declare that kind of a conflicted judge, but it's really interesting stuff that you're doing. I just wondered if you think the caveat around one recall is the same if you're interested in only the mean of the ATI score rather than like distributions. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. 
So it, it looked like the means were pretty yeah. similar. So if That's someone true. just wanted a mean, is it okay to use a single 24 hour recall? Well, technically we did uh, like just a ANOVA analysis to see if there is difference between those different measurements and there is no, but it's not exactly the same as, um, uh, as an equivalent testing. Like we test if there was a significant difference between them and there's not. So we can say that in average, the mean score will be about the same if we focus on that, that's true. But if we were doing, um, as I said, equivalent testing, which is more severe as we can say, because we restrict the um, probability of uh, being the same, then maybe we'll have seen some difference. So, and the other thing is that if we look at the agreement analysis, we can see that one versus four days of, uh, of food, uh, of 24 hour recall won't classify the participant in the same a quartile, meaning that there's kind of a big difference, even if the average is quite the same. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Alexa Ferdinands, and she's going to be speaking about the findings from Alberta's 2016 Nutrition Report Card on Food Environments for Children and Youth. My name is Alexa Ferdinands, and I'm a registered dietitian and a PhD student in public health at the University of Alberta, working under the supervision of Dr. Kim Rainey. And today I'll be discussing findings from Alberta's 2016 Nutrition Report Card on Food Environments for Children and Youth. Um, and Dr. Rain did present on this earlier this morning, so for those of you who attended that session, um, you'll just be getting an additional refresher on food environments and the report card. So as for the disclosure guidelines, I have no conflicts of interest to report. So I'll start off by introducing the Nutrition Report Card, explaining how it was developed and the grading process that's involved. And then, then I'll delve into some highlights from last year's report card, review some strengths and challenges of the process, and conclude by discussing some strengths and limitations. So the 2016 report card was produced by the Power Up team, which stands for Policy Opportunity Windows, Enhancing Research Uptake and Practice. And this team was led by Dr. K uh, Kim Rain and Candice Nikaforic, based out of the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. And I began working with this team about a year and a half ago as a research assistant when I first started graduate school there. And I'm, I'm aware that there's some individuals in the audience as well who have significantly contributed to the report card, um, so you can ask them all the difficult questions about the report card later. <laughs> um, so as I'm sure this audience is well aware, healthy eating is more than just an individual choice and it's influenced by the environments in which we live. With this in mind, the report card was designed with two key objectives. First, to provide an assessment of how current environments and policies either support or create barriers to improving children's eating behaviors and body weights. And secondly, to increase awareness of the public, practitioners, and policymakers of the relevance of food environments for health promotion and obesity prevention. And the Nutrition Report Card was modeled after Canada's Physical Activity Report Card, which I imagine many of you are familiar with. So an expert working group, including over 20 experts in public health, nutrition, physical activity from across Canada, uh, developed the Nutrition Report Card starting off with a literature review and scan of existing indices, which inform the development of the conceptual framework. And this framework encompasses five types of food environments, which are illustrated here on this slide. So first we have the physical food environment, and this pertains to what's available in our surroundings. So this would include examining healthy food availability in schools, grocery stores, recreation facilities, and so forth. Next, the communication environment looks at things like food marketing, nutrition education, and point of purchase nutrition information like food labels. Uh, the economic environment considers financial incentives for consumers and industry and government assistance programs. So this would also include things like sugar sweetened beverage taxation. And the social environment refers to the beliefs and values of a community. Um, so this environment considers issues such as uh, weight bias in schools, corporate social responsibility, and breastfeeding support in the community. And lastly, the political macro environment refers to a broader context and considers whether governments provide clear goals and action plans 
with adequate funding uh, to improve children's eating behaviors and body weights. And there are indicators that we review to assess the state of each food environment. And the benchmarks are the targets that must be met for that specific indicator. So for example, in the physical environment, one indicator is that there's a high availability of healthy food in schools. And the benchmark for this indicator is that in schools, uh, three quarters of available foods offered and served must be classified as healthy. And we'll go through an example later to kind of illustrate that. So the grading process as a whole involves searching for the best available evidence and then organizing the data for grading at a consensus decision-making meeting with the expert working group. And here you can see the grading process that was uh, conducted for each indicator. So working from left to right, uh, first we look at whether the benchmark was met. And in, as you can see in the green boxes, the choices are yes, somewhat, not at all, or inconclusive due to a lack of data. And then moving to the orange boxes, here we're looking at whether there's a policy or program in place to support the indicator. And you can see that if the policy or program is mandatory, it gets a higher grade than if it's voluntary. And finally, if high risk groups are addressed, um, such as Aboriginal, minority, or low socioeconomic status groups, then it gets additional points in the scoring process. So now that you know a little bit of the background about the report card, um, we can move on to talk about the findings from this year's report card. I'll talk about some of the highlights, um, or perhaps lowlights, as you might want to call them, since Alberta's overall grade was a D, uh, which was one grade lower than the 2015 assessment. And of particular concern in 2016 were physical food environments. So we found things such as that in 60% of neighborhoods, there are at least 10 times as many food outlets selling mostly unhealthy foods than those selling healthy ones. Additionally, over 75% of schools in Calgary and Edmonton were found to have at least one convenience store or fast food restaurant within 500 meters. So here we can go through an example to demonstrate how the grading would have been done. Um, here the category is food availability within settings and we're looking specifically at schools. Some of our major sources of data for this indicator are listed here, such as the Compass study based out of the University of Waterloo that assessed foods and beverages offered in nine Alberta schools. And as you can see, um, most of the foods that were offered and served were classified as choose least often according to the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. And in an Alberta school principal survey, it was also found that only 40% of the principals actually mandate these nutrition guidelines. And this slide lists examples of the policies or systemic programs in Alberta related to the physical food environment. And the only policy that we found that was deemed mandatory was to have health promotion coordinators assigned to schools to support comprehensive school health, while the others, like the ANGCY, were actually all voluntary. And this table also shows which setting the program or policy is applicable for. So we have schools, childcare, and community. Um, the ANGCY was the only one that was applicable to all settings, while uh, communities choose well, for example, only applies to the community. So in order to come to our final grade of a C for this indicator, we had to work through the following decisions. So first, the benchmark of having three quarters of available foods in schools classified as healthy was met by some schools. And there are policies and programs in place, but they're voluntary for the most part, and high-risk groups are not addressed. As a result of these findings, we recommended that research be conducted to assess school food environments more regularly, that we monitor comp compliance with the dietary guidelines that we do have, and that the ANGCY be mandated in all Alberta schools. And of particular interest to CON members, um, and myself, given that my PhD research revolves around weight bias, I thought I would focus on an indicator within the social environment that focuses on whether weight bias is explicitly addressed in schools and childcare. And this is a key area for action for many reasons. Um, so first of all, children as young as three years of age have been shown to exhibit negative weight-related attitudes, which increase with age. We also know that weight bias can seriously harm a child's physical, mental, and social health. And these health consequences may be related to weight-based bullying, which is the most common form of bullying in schools. Teachers might see students with obesity as being considered a burden in the classroom, which can um, then negatively impact their, their academic performance. In Alberta, we found that although healthy body images and positive social environments are broadly promoted to align with the Safe and Caring Schools Act, no direct attention is actually being paid to addressing weight bias in guidelines, curriculum, or policies. In the grades K-9 Health and Life Skills and High School Career and Life Management programs give teachers the flexibility to discuss topics related to weight bias, but it's not required. And given the fact that bullying and mental health are considered to be hot topics in schools right now, it could be helpful to piggyback onto strategies already in place 
um, tying in bo body image and weight bias topics. So in light of the lack of attention being paid to weight bias in schools and childcare, Alberta did fail this assessment. So recommendations that came from these findings included conducting intervention research to find out what works and what doesn't with respect to ways to reduce weight bias in schools and childcare, linking weight bias topics into school curriculum um, and into teacher and childcare work education, and finally creating a provincial policy that would actually prohibit weight bias in schools and childcare. In implementing the report card, we have uncovered some strengths and challenges of the process. Some of the strengths include that there was a really strong expert working group with a wide range of experts in research, practice, and policy from across Canada to inform the process. We now have a baseline for future data collection to, um, to assess, for example, current exposure to unhealthy versus healthy foods and see where we can make improvements. And the report card also helps to increase the public's awareness surrounding the importance of supporting healthy food environments uh, for there was significant media coverage and positive feedback from the ministers of health and education. Some of the challenges though is that it's a very time intensive process, so there are 33 indicators needing data to be collected, and getting the right contacts and permission can be quite challenging. It can also be hard to get data um, that's, that will be consistently released in Alberta for annual comparisons. And it's essential to be consistent with applying the grading criteria, but with certain benchmarks, it's inevitable that some subjectivity and value judgments may come into play. And some benchmarks have needed to be adjusted from year to year, depending on what's relevant to include in the, on the public health agenda. And finally, some jurisdictions may find the grading process to be rather controversial if the findings happen to put the, that jurisdiction in a poor light. So overall, the report card helps us to monitor, inform, engage, and study. By outlining these policy-relevant benchmarks, we can gauge progress in children's food environments over time. And communicating our findings can help to stimulate a national dialogue about these topics, or about these issues, and outline a policy-relevant agenda for moving forward. Essentially, the report card can show us how to make healthy food the easy choice for children and youth. And right now, we're wrapping up data collection for the 2017 report card, which will be released in September. Um, and there is funding to continue producing annual report cards in Alberta for the next five years. And this includes research into the impact on food, and food environments and children's health statuses, including um, changes in their eating behaviors and body weights. And we're also working on helping communities in Alberta collect data on their own, which will be incorporated into future report cards. Um, the team has developed a report card toolkit, which is meant to be used by other jurisdictions with the goal of one day developing a national report card. So the report card was funded by a coalition's linking action and science for prevention grant from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And the 2015 and 2016 report cards are both available as um, short summary reports and full-length reports on the Alberta Policy Coalition website. And I've included um, contact information for myself and Dr. Kim Rain and Krista Milford, who's the current project coordinator. So thank you very much. Hi, great presentation, Alexa, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you said that Alberta went down a grade mm -hmm. from last year, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit about that. Was it, do you have better evidence? Was, did your benchmarks change, or did the policies in that food environment actually get worse? So, possibly a mixture of the two. So there, there was 41 indicators in the 2015, and this one there was 33, so there was some changes there. I think um, a lot of it had to do with the changes in the funding, so a lot of the funding for certain programs um, that would support healthy food environments within the political um, macro in the, that environment. So I think that was part, part of the reason for why it dropped from a C to a D. Um, okay, great, thanks. Anyone else? So thanks, Alexa, great talk. Um, so w with the limitations, you talk about value judgments, and I guess that would be one of my bigger concerns when, when you've got measures that should be objective. So how do you get, how could you improve that? Or is there a way to improve it? Is it, is it the working group or the people analyzing it all? You know, pe you know I can see w who would be analyzing it, but why would you have value judgments? 
and maybe give an example where that could occur. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's a mixture of both. Every year that the report card is produced, I mean, we're like they're refining the process with the expert working group and how the grading is being done. Um, I wasn't actually. I'm not. I wasn't actually involved with with the actual grading process in the past couple of years, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I do know some people in the audience that might be able to help you with that answer after the <laughs> session. <laughs> Sorry. We do. Have or they can. Yeah. We do have time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's Dr. Rain. <laughs> she can answer. Oh, Dr. Yeah, yes. she's here. Thanks. You did a really good job, Alexa. <laughs> he really put you on the spot. So in terms of making value judgments, I mean, we're really, we're, we're addressing issues that there are no clear cut, this is good and this is not good. So, you know, and often our data don't align specifically with the actual benchmarks. So the school example that Alexa gave you, um, we didn't have data that mapped specifically on to that 75%. We had several sources of data that gave us a good idea that we weren't making that. But we, as a group, debated what, you know, what the data that we had, the limits of it, and made a, made a judgment that we somewhat met the criteria, not. So it's not one person. It's not one person. It is a group. It's a consensus group. I'm just wondering in terms of the uptake of this information or the message from the report card, do you think it would be more difficult for individuals to uptake information from political things or the fact that you live close to a fast food restaurant where you can't control living close to a fast food restaurant if it's built there, mm -hmm. right? So in terms of built environment, do you think it's more difficult for the German population to uptake that information and say, I'm gonna change my dietary habits comparatively to something where I can change what I purchase or what I do on an individual level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you were asking the question, actually. Mm -hmm. I think it depends who the, who the audience is that, because I mean, this report card is applicable to a wide variety of people within the population. So say you're um, work, a child care worker at, an, at a f child care facility, then you have the power to be able to influence the types of foods that are offered and served perhaps within the child care. Um, but clearly you're not going to be able to change um, type of government funding for health promotion programs if you're in that situation too. Um, so yeah, the, I, the idea is that it pinpoints certain areas that there's opportunities for change and as, um, with the media coverage and just pu greater public awareness too, I think that helps to um, push things along. So our, our next speaker is uh, Monique Potvin Kent, and she will be, I, I wanted to have a placard for this one, uh, Stop Sugarcoating Children's Breakfast Cereals. <laughs> Child-targeted cereals in Canada require reformation. <laughs> I always like to tie my research to policy, so. <laughs> okay, so I'll start out by saying um, that I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, this research was actually unfunded, and um, I do advocacy work for the Stop Marketing to Kids Coalition, but that is unpaid work, so. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the food environment, um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about child-targeted breakfast cereals. So um, I have three kids of my own, so breakfast cereals are something that, you know, kids ask for, they're heavily marketed, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, the health issue we're starting with, childhood obesity, I don't think it's a surprise to this audience that obesity rates for children have increased dramatically since the 1980s, um, and the combined rate for overweight and obesity right now is uh, almost 32%. Now, one of the determinants of childhood obesity is food and beverage marketing to children. I've done a lot of research on food and beverage marketing to children. Um, there were two big systematic reviews done in the mid-2000s, and they both came to the same conclusions, that food and beverage marketing had an impact on children's levels of obesity, had an impact on their food preferences, so children prefer to eat foods that they see advertised on TV, on the internet. It has an impact on their short-term food intake, um, and it also has an impact on 
on their food requests. Now recently, it was just published in 2016, there was a Canadian group that actually did a systematic review um, and meta-analysis of a whole bunch of randomized controlled trials that had looked at the link between food marketing and food preferences and also short-term food intake. And they also saw a relationship between these variables. Now, the majority of products that are being advertised to children, whether it's on television, whether it's on the internet, in schools, um, in a variety of settings, they're high in fat, sugar, and sodium. So I've done a lot of research over the past few years that's demonstrated this. Now, the WHO has recommended that countries limit the volume of food and beverage marketing that children see, not just in media forms, but also in, in settings where children gather, and also on product packages. Now, in terms of the policy context in Canada, um, food and beverage marketing to children is self-regulated in Canada. So in uh, 2007, the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative uh, was initiated by 16 large food and beverage companies. So it was Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Nestle and all the, the big guys. Um, half of those companies said that they were going to only advertise healthier dietary choices to children, while the other half said they weren't going to advertise to children under the age of uh, 12 years old at all. Now, the media that was included in these pl pledges included television and radio and print, digital media. It also included um, advertising in schools, but no pledges were made whatsoever um, with regard to uh, product packaging. Now, in Quebec, the policy context is very, very different. So in Quebec, they actually have a law called the Consumer Protection Act. It's existed since uh, 1980. And basically what this law says is that there can be no commercial advertising targeted at children under the age of 13 years old. So that includes food advertising, toy advertising, any type of advertising cannot be targeted at children. It applies to all media forms, and it also applies to child settings like schools and daycare centers. But package labeling, again, is excluded here because that's a federal responsibility. The provincial government cannot uh, have a law in this area. Now, breakfast cereals are a product that are very, very heavily marketed to children. So in the US in 2009, breakfast cereal marketing was actually ranked second in terms of spending dollars, um, in terms of advertising to children. And in 2015, it was estimated that children just on television alone were seeing about 500 breakfast cereal ads per year. Now, in Canada, I've done research uh, looking at this as well, and in Canada, kids between the ages of 2 and 11 are seeing about 33 breakfast cereal out, or ads per month on television alone, so that works out to about 400 breakfast cereal ads on TV alone, but of course, kids are being exposed to marketing in a whole bunch of different forms of media and different settings. Now, breakfast cereal advertising is the third most frequent um, category that's advertised to children, and it constitutes it constitutes 11% of the advertising that kids see both on television and on the internet. Now, I had three research questions when I started this study. First of all, I wanted to find out the nutritional quality and healthfulness of the child-targeted breakfast cereals that we sell here in Canada. Second of all, I wanted to see how predominant added sugar was in those products. And thirdly, I wanted to see which companies really need to improve the healthfulness of their breakfast cereals. So what we did in terms of methodology is we visited a convenience sample in Ottawa um, and in Gatineau on the Quebec side of the top five uh, food re retailers in Canada. So we went to Loblaws, Sobeys, Metro, Costco, and Walmart. We made a list of all the cold breakfast cereals that were, were sold. We took photos of all six sides of the box. We gathered nutritional information from the nutrition facts table, so from serving size, calories, the fats, uh, sodium, fiber, sugar, and protein. We also counted up the number of added sugars just by looking at the ingredients list. We also noted the first five ingredients in uh, each breakfast cereal. Then to determine the healthfulness of the cereals, we use the UK nutrient profile model. So it's one of the nutrient profiling models that's been used quite extensively in research. It's been shown to be very valid. And one of the reasons I like to use it is that it, it takes both positive and negative nutrients into consideration. So the positive in nutrients, it looks at protein, fiber, and the percentage of fruit, vegetables, and nuts. And the negative nutrients, it looks at energy, saturated fat, total fat, and sodium. 
Now, the last thing we did is we did an assessment of child targeting. So is the cereal on the, the actual packaging, is it targeting children? So a child targeted cereal, we developed a definition based on uh, the work of Charlene Elliott and a few others. Um, first of all, if it featured candy, it was child targeted, or if it had child directed images such as cartoons, if it had child directed messages like, hey kids. Um, if it had primary colors or ca cartoon-like fonts, like in the image here in uh, the, the corn pops. Um, did it have tie-ins to children's TV shows, to, uh, to musical acts or to movies, like in the Cinnamon Toast Crunch box here, you can see that the minions are uh, featured front and center on that box. Um, did, did the box in any way, the packaging, did it encourage the child's interaction uh, with the box? So were there any games or puzzles on the box? Um, also, um, one of the, the other, the last part of the definition was whether children were mentioned in the brand name or logo. So some cereals are actually called kids, you know, spelt with a Z or something. So it directly targets chil children that way. Now what we found was about 20% of the, the breakfast cereals that were sold in Ottawa Gatineau are actually child targeted. So there were a total of 262 cereals, 20% uh, targeted at children, the rest targeted, we called them not child targeted cereals. Now there were big, big differences in uh, the nutrients, the average nutrients between the child targeted and the not child targeted cereals. Um, so first of all, the child targeted cereals were lower, significantly lower in total fat and saturated fat, which is very positive. But on the negative side, they were also much, much lower in fiber. Uh, they were much lower in protein, they were significantly higher in sugar, and they were also significantly higher in sodium. So overall, their nutritional profile was much poorer compared to the not child-targeted cereals. Now, when we looked at their overall healthfulness using the UK nutrient profile model, what we found is that for the child-targeted cereals, about 85% of those cereals were actually classified as less healthy. Um, and only 15% were classified as healthier according to the UK nutrient profile model. For the not child targeted cere cereals, there was a higher, per higher percentage that were classified, um, or sorry, a lower percentage that were classified as less healthy, so it was about 65%. And uh, so what we found is that actually three times more likely that the child targeted cereals be classified as less healthy compared to the not child targeted cereals. Now, when we looked at the number of sugars um, in the ingredients list, it was quite interesting. Um, first of all, if I just draw your attention to that, the second column there. Um, so 60% of the cereals, the child-targeted cereals, had between two to three different sugars in the cereal, 60%. And if you look at just one number below that, where it says four to six sugars, 20% um, actually had four to six different types of sugar in the cereal. Um, also, if you look up at the first row there under zero, there were no child targeted cereals that had no sugar at all. That, that's just not a food category that <laughs> exists. Um, with the not child targeted cereals, 9% of them didn't have any sugar at all. Um, but interestingly, if you look down at that last circle there, um, seven to 11 sugars, there are actually 6% of the not child targeted cereals that had between seven and 11 different types of sugar. Uh, very shocking uh, results. In terms of the most frequently occurring ing ingredients on the ingre in the ingredients list, uh, corn was the number one for child targeted cereals, followed by sugar in second place. 75% of them had sugar as their second ingredient, and 33% had sugar again as the, th the third ingredient. Uh, we saw a similar profile with the not child targeted cereals, except for the first ingredient was, was different, uh, starting with oats, and then sugar and sugar in the second and third position came up the most frequently. Um, the last question that I, that I wanted to look at in this study was which companies, because I, in all the, the, the research I've done in marketing um, over the last few years, what I've really found is that some companies are trying very, very hard to make changes to their product ranges. Uh, they are trying to really limit their food and beverage marketing to children. They are trying to, to have an impact on obesity prevention. Other companies are not trying at all. <laughs> um, 
So I wanted to look at the companies that did have child-targeted cereals, and in fact what we found was, first of all, Kellogg's was the company that had the, the most um, not, or sorry, child-targeted cereals that fell into the healthier range. Um, and you can see though, if you look at all those, those red bars, those are all the less healthy cereals, that there were six companies, and these are big, big food manufacturers from General Mills, Metro, Nature's Path, Post, Quaker, Sally's, Weedabix, they only, not Weedabix, sorry, but those, the six ones that I mentioned before that, they all had, like all of the cereals that they had that targeted children, they were all less healthy. So they didn't have any, like in their offering of cereals, they didn't have any cereals whatsoever that fell into the healthier category. So clearly there's work to be done here. Now in terms of uh, just summarizing the results quickly, so first of all, the child targeted cereals uh, were significantly higher in sugar and sodium, lower in fiber and protein compared to the not child targeted cereals. 60% uh, of the child targeted cereals had two to three types of added sugar and 75% of the child targeted cereals had sugar as their second ingredient. In terms of the overall healthfulness of, of the cereals, uh, child targeted cereals were three times more likely to be classified as less healthy compared to the um, not child targeted cereals. And in terms of responsibility, so who is manufacturing these cereals? Um, as I mentioned, six companies only had unhealthy child targeted cereals in their kind of, you know, food product range of, of breakfast cereals. So. Now, in terms of uh, policy recommendations from, from work like this, um, I think it's really important that breakfast cereals uh, reformulate some of their products, um, develop new healthier products that, that are available. Um, in particular, sugar and sodium really need to be decreased and fiber needs to be increased in, uh, in children's breakfast cereals. Now, um, one way to do this certainly is by setting, by the, by the federal government setting targets. So this is what's going on in the UK right now. Uh, the UK has set targets of a 20% a decrease in, um, in sugar in products that target children. So if Canada followed them all, I think that we could have very, very interesting results. Um, I also think it's really interesting with the new um, labeling guidelines that have just come on, they were just published in the, the Gazette 2 in, uh, in December. And so now starting, well, I mean, it's gonna take about five years for them to be implemented. Um, but because now, uh, Cereal manufacturers, as well as other products that target children, are going to have to start grouping all of the sugars under one heading. This might have an impact on the formulation of breakfast cereals and other products that target children. So because manufacturers are not going to want to put sugar as the very first ingredient in their breakfast cereal. And let me tell you, any breakfast cereal that has kind of four or five types of sugar added to that breakfast cereal, by weight, that then becomes the first ingredient in the breakfast cereal. And so this new regulation might push some reformulation, but the federal government might need to, to also step up and set targets for industry in terms of reducing uh, sugar, I think. Um, my second recommendation is I really think we need to stop marketing to children on uh, product packages. Um, so I'm part of a, a coalition that's called the Stop Marketing to Kids Coalition. You might have already heard about it um, in the conference. So it's headed up by the Heart and Stroke Foundation and uh, the Childhood Obesity Foundation. And so we've been pushing to have uh, the federal government reduce commercial marketing to children. This is children under the age of 16. Um, and we were talking here about restricting the marketing of all foods and beverages to, to children. Now, what's been happening uh, recently in the Senate, um, there's a bill actually that um, its first reading was on September 27th, just last fall. Um, it's called the Child Health Protection Act, and it's actually an act to amend the food, an, an act to amend the Food and Drugs Act um, to prohibit food and beverage marketing directed at children, and the age range that's been set here is children under the age of, uh, of 13 years of age. Um, but they have included packaging as part of, and saying the, the Marketing to Kids Coalition, when they define marketing, packaging is included. When the WHO also defines marketing, packaging is included. And that's something that's sorely lacking from the policies that exist right now. Thank you very much.
So our last speaker in this session is Shauna Burke, and she'll be speaking on parents' perception of the family and community-based programs and support required to enhance physical literacy in children, an exploratory study. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around to the last presentation and one that doesn't have anything to do with nutrition. So I was kind of slotted in here, so thanks a lot. Um, so the title of this talk is Parents' Perceptions of the Family and Community-Based Resources Required to Enhance Physical Literacy in Children. So uh, two of my graduate students and I uh, have conduct conducted this exploratory study. And uh, were my PhD student, Kristen, able to be here to present this, I'm sure she'd do a much better job at at describing the uh, methodology and results, but uh, as her supervisor, I'll do my best to muddle my way through and not disappoint her. <laughs> and I should know by now that it's the green button. Okay. Oh, the big green the button, big gotcha. The other green okay, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I don't have anything to declare. Uh, I do have two um, grants to support graduate work for this project, actually for a larger program of work. Uh, and this, pro this specific study is one of those uh, studies that falls within that work, uh, as well as some funding from the Ontario Heart and Stroke Foundation, uh, specifically as a SPARC advocacy grant. So that's more of an acknowledgement, really. Um, so as many of you likely know, uh, there has been some um, debate, I would say, in the literature around uh, uh, physical literacy and what that means. But more recently, there's been some a consensus on, on this definition. And generally speaking, it it's refers to the motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge, and understanding to maintain physical activity for life. So it goes beyond just being able to be physically active, uh, but to a lot of other dimensions and behaviors associated with being active for life. Uh, in 2016, the participation report card uh, assigned and actually physical lit literacy appeared for the first time and was evaluated for the first time on that report uh, and that got a, a D plus. Uh, specifically, kids uh, between the ages of 8 and 12, 44% um, of those uh, were not uh, meeting adequate levels of physical literacy and that was measured by uh, the Canadian Assessment for Physical Literacy. Um, generally, uh, a lot of literature, literature has focused on physical literacy within the context of physical education, uh, and as such, a lot of the resources and supports uh, that have been discussed in this area focuses specifically on physical education and strategies for schools. Um, but we also know that parents play a really important role in promoting physical literacy in, in their children and families. So we do see a gap in the literature related to what resources and supports might be necessary for parents or what parents identify as necessary uh, to improve physical literacy in their children and families. So the purpose of this work was to identify parents' perceptions of the resources and opportunities required at both family and community levels to improve physical literacy within their children and families. Uh, we recruited parents of children 16 years of age and younger uh, living in Ontario. We did this by social media. They completed an online questionnaire that had a number of questions, two of which were open-ended and related to uh, the topics that I just mentioned in terms of physical literacy and promoting that among children in general and in the community. It's important to note, um, so some of this larger survey, we actually asked what parents, um, and I'm not discussing that today for the sake of time, but we actually asked parents, what, what do you know about physical literacy? Are you familiar with this term? What does it mean to you? Um, so after asking those questions, we provided parents with a definition of physical literacy, as well as some examples specific to children, um, and then asked them what they felt might be necessary for them to improve that, uh, or if it needed improvement in their children and families. Uh, we analyzed the data, uh, so these open-ended responses, uh, using the thematic analysis methodology described by Braun and Clark. So, we had 79 parents complete the survey, uh, representing 21 cities and towns in Ontario. So you can see here, most participants identified as female, white, married, university educated, employed full time, and with a household income of uh, greater than $90,000 per year. So it was a quite high uh, SES um, sample. <clears throat> 
So in terms of the results at the family level, so what did parents identify as being important at the family level? Two main themes emerged, and I'm going to talk about those in the slides that follow. The first theme was family-friendly exercise programs. And the second theme that had four accompanying sub-themes that emerged from the responses uh, was just related to the types of, the specific types of support uh, that they identified as being important. So the first theme, again, is family-friendly exercise programs. And on the basis of, of responses from participants, uh, we define that as family-oriented programs that are inclusive and adaptable for all ages and abilities. So I've provided some sample quotes here that are illustrative of, of uh, the broader themes. So this parent said, more family-friendly exercise programs that are subsidized and advertised well by the community. Moving on to theme two was, again, this general theme of types of support with four sub-themes that emerged. The first was financial. Um, so again, based on the parent responses, that definition was improving accessibility to physical activity by reducing the cost of programs and gym memberships, and maybe providing subsidies or rebates for children's participation in physical activity. A quote here from a parent was to reduce the cost for families of sporting activities. Another sub-theme that emerged under this broader theme uh, of types of support was occupational. So this referred to support from employers, allowing uh, parents to have flexible hours or perhaps a shortened work week in order to be able to engage in physical activity with their children. So one parent said, more flexible work day that would allow me more time with my children before and after school for physical activity. Another, uh, the third sub-theme under types was time management, uh, something that I'm sure as parents many of us can relate to, uh, but that support and assistance that enables parents to better manage their time and coordinate their family schedules in order to facilitate opportunities for regular physical activity. Uh, quote here, coordinating time work to be able to attend a fitness center would help our family improve our physical literacy. And then lastly, the last sub-theme under this broader theme of type of support was technology related. So this encompassed internet-based resources as well as apps um, and activity tracking devices to support parents as they encouraged, encouraged and promoted physical activity uh, in their families. So one parent suggested apps for quick at-home family workouts. The next set of results relates to the needs that parents identified at a community level in order to improve physical literacy in their children. Um, the first theme was community-based opportunities. The second was school-based opportunities for physical activity and, and physical literacy. As you can see here, there are various sub-themes that also emerge, and I'll talk about those now. So again, num theme number one was community-based opportunities for physical activity and improving phys physical literacy. Uh, parents said they needed things to be affordable, uh, low or no cost physical activity, including gym memberships, sports, and exercise programs. Definitely reduce the cost of gym memberships, one participant noted. Accessible was another sub-theme, so creating more community spaces, perhaps in rural areas, and facilities for physical activity, as well as increasing the number of physical activity programs and the registration of of children within those programs. So one participant noted that in the city of Toronto, a lot of sport programs fill up within minutes and then their kids are uh, left not being able to participate in that. Another parent said, increased access to community sport programs for children, more spaces available, reduced costs. The third sub-theme under this community-based opportunities was diverse. So uh, providing options that were non-competitive outdoors as well as opportunities for a wide variety of sport and physical activity programming. So one illustrative quote here was to change the mindset that physical literacy has to happen at a gym and through organized sports. Community agencies and muni municipalities need to support and fund opportunities for families to play outside. Okay, so the second theme um, at this community level was school-based opportunities for physical activity and physical literacy. The first related to daily physical education and that encompassed the provision of daily PE with a focus on movement broadly as well as education for teachers. Uh, one parent said, gym class taking place on a daily basis rather than a couple of times a week, teaching the fundamentals of movement rather than dodgeball each class. 
Another sub theme, again, this, this theme that emerged was this outdoor opportunity. So increasing opportunities for physical activity and improved physical literacy through outdoor uh, PE and recess. One parent suggested better and more activities in schools allow kids to spend more time outside like we did as kids. And then the last sub-theme, again within this broader theme of, a, of uh, sorry, school-based opportunities was physical skills beyond sport. Um, and that's opportunities for an exposure to physical skills beyond competitive or team-based sports. And one reflective um, quote suggests, allow children to focus less on sports and more on other physical activities when in gym class. Games that increase physical literacy, yoga, dance, Pilates, circuit training. So to wrap up, um, interestingly on these responses, many parents used the terms physical activity and physical literacy interchangeably. Uh, and this is perhaps not surprising uh, given what we also found through this survey and what I haven't presented was a really wide variety of um, understanding, a, a lot of diverse understandings of what that term means uh, to parents. And so perhaps related is that for this study, most parents identified that additional physical activity opportunities were what was needed to increase physical literacy in their families. Uh, as you can see, the, the needs that were identified by parents really varied across domains and different levels of action. So there were some, you know, ranging from um, what was needed at home to uh, the school to uh, potential modifications in the workplace. Something I didn't mention uh, to this point was that we also asked uh, parents if they'd be interested in joining something that we're in the very preliminary stages of developing for parents, and that's a parent-focused health advocacy network uh, for parents in Ontario. So we did ask parents, would you be interested in joining such a network? Um, and 32% said that they would. And we feel that um, this could be an important opportunity to engage, inform, and empower parents to become advocates for the health of their children and families, and in these 31 communities that these parents um, lived in, or live in, and uh, perhaps given the, the opportunities that they suggested might be required to enhance physical literacy in their families, those could be addressed through such a, a network for parents. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, but I'm going to start with the first one. Sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, like, I think it's both a positive and maybe a negative, and that's your very homogeneous group that you had of the, you know, the high SES groups. And I suspect that the answers may be quite different in, in a lower SES group. And I'm just wondering if the target is correct, because I would think that... You didn't show us, I don't think you showed any uh, like, demo, like characteristics of your subjects with regards to health. Mm -hmm. And that would be nice to see that correlation. Yeah, and, and I agree. And thank you for that question. We didn't actually collect the, those data, uh, but I agree it would be nice to look at that. And clearly, I don't think this is a, a very representative sample. Again, it's an exploratory study, so we were just kind of uh, getting a sense of what we could from as many parents as we could. Um, interesting to us, though, was how this idea of things being affordable, uh, despite the high SES, you know, sample being, that, that's, a, that's a concern for parents and, and across the board. And so I think that that's something that, you know, to us when it, it was an interesting uh, note. And again, given the exploratory and, and kind of preliminary stage that we're at with this work, I think that... Um, Obviously, we have to be careful with how we interpret these findings, but also might serve as kind of a framework or a starting point for what we do moving forward with this network and what types of, um, you know, ideas for discussion we might bring to the table. Anyone else? Questions? Uh, did you find, and I didn't get the age of the kids for your sample, but any differences between those who had younger kids and those who had sort of teens? Because we find clinically, if they're 14 and they're not, haven't been doing a sport all the way along, to find them something to do is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. And suggesting like a walk with your parents is the worst <laughs> thing yeah. like you could ever suggest. Right. So like that, 
that's clinically where we see, and maybe this is an SES difference as well, is, is you know, where, where do those kids go? And I, and I don't always think a, a gym is appropriate mm -hmm. uh, or that they're going to feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really good point. Thank you for that. Um, and so we, we targeted parents with kids ages 16 years of age or younger. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been in this situation where you've conducted a survey-based study and then you get to analyses and you think, we asked how old the kids were, right? <laughs> nope. So we actually don't have how old the, the, ch the um, children were of the parents. We have the parents' age. And unfortunate oversight that didn't make it to the online survey was how old the child was. So we don't have that information, um, but I agree, you know, um, very different types of physical activity opportunities that would be required for the different age groups, particularly that kind of uh, pre-adolescence age where that is a, an in-between where, you know, yeah, going for a walk or playing a game with your parents is, you know, maybe not, not, not cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Nope, we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, So this brings the session to close, and if we can just give every speaker another round of applause. That'd be great.